Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Chrome Enterprise Technical Community Hour. My name is Demian, and I will be your host today. In today's session, we will have Thomas Steiner from the Chrome Developer Simulation team. Thomas is an expert in web development with a focus on WebAssembly. And he is also working on a lot of new AI-related projects for Chrome. This is our agenda for today. I will start with an introduction of the CER program and the technical community hour. And then I had it over to Thomas so we can talk about WebAssembly. At the end, we will share some resources so you can go deeper into these topics. Today's technical community hour is brought to you by the Chrome Enterprise Recommended Program, which is Google's partner program for third-party solutions that are optimized for Chrome OS and integrated with the Chrome browser. This series of talks brings you the opportunity to engage with our team about new features and updates, enterprise development best practices, and our overall enterprise strategy. Now, without any further ado, I'll pass it over to Thomas, and he will kick us off. Thank you very much, Amir. All right, let me just enter the presentation here. Here we are. So welcome to the introduction of um, the WebAssembly programming language, if you will. My name is Thomas Steiner, and I, I want to start with the important bits first. So it's WebAssembly. So web, no space, assembly, uppercase. And um, WebAssembly is typically abbreviated as VASM. And um, it's not all uppercase. So you will see a lot of people get this wrong. So they will write all uppercase VASM. when actually, it's a uh, um, uh, uppercase W, but then the rest is lowercase. So I'm just a kind of perfectionist when it comes to how do you actually correctly write this. So no space, and then W uppercase, but everything else lowercase. And with that out of the way, let's get started. Um, this is, by the way, directly in the specification of WebAssembly. So um, even the spec authors um, thought this was um, noteworthy. Um, but yeah, let's, let's get going actually on um, what this is all about. So there's languages that are made for use. One of them is JavaScript. A lot of you might be very, very familiar with it. If you have something like uh, factor 1 equals 5, factor 2 equals 10, and then a result that is just a multiplication of the two, well, that's something that's pretty easy to understand. On the other end of the spectrum, we have um, languages that are made for machines. And in this case, I have assembly for Intel 64 and IA32 architectures. Um, I have annotated here what's going on. So we have mock x5. So this means set the value of register ax to 5. And we have the similar thing for the register cx. This time, this time we set it to 10. And then we have mal cx. Which means we multiply the value of register ax and the value of register cx, and we store the result in the register ax. So yeah, you can see already this is not very much made for humans. It's made for machines, um, but it's fast. So that's one of the obvious advantages of having languages that are designed for machines. And our very first attempt at making something like this, but higher level, was something called ASM.js. So you can see here, this dates back to 2014. Um, the effort is a little bit older even. Like 2014 is when um, it was completely spec. It was a strict, or actually still is, but it's kind of outdated, a strict subset of JavaScript that could be used as a low-level efficient target language for compilers. So important, this was nothing that people were expected to write by hand. This was something that um, yeah was a compilation target. So people would take language um, like C or C++, and then compile that to ASM.js, this strict subset of JavaScript. And why was it faster? Well, because it was improved by limiting the language features to those that are amenable to ahead-of-time compilation, essentially making uh, sure that everything that is ahead-of-time uh, optimizable um, is yeah, being optimized that way. Um, WebAssembly, then, is a direct successor of ASM.js. Um, like ASM.js, it's a low-level assembly-like language, but even more assembly-like than ASM.js. It has a very compact binary, binary format that runs at near-native performance, and uh, it provides 
languages such as C, C++, Rust, and many more. We will see this in a couple more slides um, with a compilation target so that they can run on the web. And by the way, not just the web, but also on the server, on edge uh, computing um, servers, and so on. So initially, it started as running on the web. But um, these days, WebAssembly can run on way more um, platforms than just the web browser. Let's compare um, what we have seen before in um, the assembly for Intel architectures with what um, the Rasm texture problem is like. So we have i32 const 5, which is um, the integer value of 5, and we put it on the stack. i32 const 10, the same with the n this time. We also put, it, put this on the stack. And then i32 mul. So we run a multiplication um, operation on the two last items on the stack and then push the result onto the stack. So pretty similar ideas than before with the um, Intel assembly, but this time um, this is WebAssembly. And this is the uh, textual representation. If you sort of have a little bit of an assembly background, this is not too hard to understand and to follow. But again, most people would never, ever write this. So WebAssembly is something that people compile to. Um, they don't really write WebAssembly by hand. Well, if you wanted to, you could actually do it. So this is um, taking the idea of the multiplication function and um, written in the textual format. So this is uh, using something called S expressions. So we have a module, and you have the function, which is named model, multiply, multiply. and it takes two vectors, um, param um, one and param two, so, sorry, the other, other way around, um, two params, vector one, and the other param, vector two. Both are integer 30, 32s. And then the result is an integer 32 as well. And we get both um, vector 1 and vector 2 from um, the stack. So we put them onto the stack. And then we run the multiplication and just return the result. And the entire thing gets exported as a function called mul. And um, like that, it's usable um, by other purpose on the models. But again, this is nothing that you would write by hand typically. Actually, um, what, it go, what goes on the wire is typically um, the binary format. And this is um, just a shorter version of it. So annotated, it looks like this. So we have the VASM binary magic, then we have uh, the VASM binary um, version, then we have section codes, section sizes, we have, we have the num types, then we have the actual function definition, number parameters, i32, i32, and so on. Um, later on, if you scroll down, you could see um, the multiplication. But yeah, this is a binary. So this is obviously even less than the textual format of uh, WebAssembly meant for human consumption. This is purely what goes onto the web. But for you as a background, for WASM, there's always two ways how you can represent it. Binary, which is what goes over the wire, and the textual format. If you ever wanted to um, debug WebAssembly um, by hand and understand what is going on, or if you actually want to write that assembly by hand for whatever reason. So there's a lot of uh, languages that you, you can uh, compile to WebAssembly. Um, this slide, by the way, is not uh, exhaustive, so there's even more. And um, there's different ways how you can get this running. So there's direct support, so you can just compile directly to WebAssembly. Or the other way is you can compile the uh, interpreter of a language, for example, for PHP, um, to WebAssembly and then run. Um, the PHP code in the interpreter that is um, converted to WebAssembly. So let me just go through this list just for the sake of uh, testing my knowledge of the logos. So we have Swift with the word here, we have Python, we have the Go language, we have AssemblyScript, we have OCaml, we have Zik, we have Dart, we have Objective C, we have Rail, we have Kotlin, we have PHP, we have Rust, we have JavaScript, and we have C. For the continuation of the uh, slides, I want to continue with uh, C++, just because it's a language that um, for most JavaScript developers is relatively accessible still. So you can still mostly make sense of it. And also because obviously it's one of the more popular um, WebAssembly languages that we use in combination with WASP. All right, so let's get started with a very, very simple C++ um, function. So in this case, it's just a main function that prints hello world. So no big surprises in there. Um, we include standard I.O., um, which means that uh, we can use uh, print app. <coughs> we print hello world, and then we return zero, which means everything has gone correctly. Um, 
everything went well in this C program. Um, the way you compile it to um, something that, that you can execute on your computer is by using the GCC compiler. So you have GCC, hello.c, and then um, you have the minus O for output parameter. And uh, let's just call the uh, program hello. And if we run this, it will give us an executable that we can then directly execute on the command. Um, the same for WebAssembly would use, um, instead of GCC, the EMCC program, which is uh, part of MScript. So the rest of the syntax is pretty similar. We have hello.c minus o hello.html. And this will give us an HTML page that we can open in the browser. This HTML page loads a JavaScript file, which then in turn loads a WebAssembly file. If you modify the compilation um, syntax here, and instead of .html, provide .js, we can skip the HTML file, and um, it will directly return as a JavaScript. We can run in the browser, or we can run it in Node.js. Um, so remember, I told you at the beginning, um, WebAssembly also works on the server these days. So one of the server environments that is pretty common these days is Node.js. So you can just um, run this um, JavaScript file in Node, and it will then in turn load the WASM file automatically and run and execute the code. So if you do this, actually, um, so if you run the uh, Node program with Hello.js, well, it prints Hello World, no big surprises. Um, not very exciting, but yeah, it does what it does. And um, you can also execute the WASM file that you obtained from this directly with um, a WASM runtime, in this case, WASM time. Um, if you run WASM time and then pass it the hello.wasm, it will also just execute the page. So there's different ways to get WebAssembly really running in the browser, on the server, or even with a WASM runtime directly bypassing any JavaScript and executing just the WebAssembly file itself. So this was the Hello World. Let's get started with uh, something a little bit more real world. And in this case, it's a program called mkbitbind. You can see here what it does essentially by the uh, screenshots. It takes a color PNG image, or bit, uh, sorry, bitmap image, Windows bitmap image, and returns a black and white um, PDM. So PDM is a very simple um, pixel format for um, annotating images uh, in a way that is human readable or encoding images in a way that is human readable. And um, why is this program even there? Why does it exist? Well, this program is part of a suite of programs for um, tracing color pixel images into vector images. So this is like a pre-processing step for converting something that can be traced more easily. So you can see here um, with the screenshots, this is executing the program mkbitmap minus f2 minus s2 minus t 0.48 in bpm minus o for out, out dot pdm. So it's not a type of bpm as Windows bitmap as input format and pdm is um, the uh, PDM um, pixel format that is human readable. And um, yeah, that's easy to encode. So you can see already um, what it does um, by looking at the uh, graphics here. Essentially, it takes different parameters, and then it takes um, the file name for the input file and for the output file. You can execute this on the command line, and it will just work as um, you can see in the script. So, how would you get this to WebAssembly? Well, the first step is to just compile it more so that you can see how it reacts locally on your computer. For this, um, you download the uh, Codrace package, which contains the mkbitmap bit, MK package. You run the configure program, which would then um, yeah, configure the uh, isolation process or compilation process according to your system. So you can see this is a uh, pretty long output here. I've uh, uh, cut it. so that you can, like, if you execute it, you, you will see that this is a lot longer in practice. But um, for here, for the slides, I just left a couple of lines. So this will configure the program so that it can run on my uh, computer. In this case, I uh, configured <coughs> for my Mac computer. The next step is to um, make this program so that it will um, yeah, get actually, actually compiled. Um, I run make check according to the instructions. Well, it will uh, then make the program as it finds uh, the source code and the source. Um, and then it just goes through the different steps. Again, this is a very um, yeah, long output, so I truncated it again. Um, in the end, it just says nothing to be done for check AM. 
But um, yeah, I can see already there's some tests here that um, apparently got executed correctly. Um, but yeah, this is regular compilation. And then in practice, you would install this program to your computer. So you uh, run sudo make install. Um, it says it makes the uh, program ready uh, as for the source file. Um, and yeah, then just copies it over to user local bin. And then you can um, run this program by executing and take it. So the very simplest way of running the code program is just by running mkbitmap minus minus version. And you can see this prints uh, the bitmap 116. Uh, and a copyright of this um, who, uh, for the person who owns the copyright of this program. So this is locally on a command. But why am I showing you this? Because the way to get this to compile with, Web with WebAssembly is pretty simple. Um, to compile to WebAssembly, we first make clean. So we remove everything from the previous compilation step, because now um, the configure step that we will run for running this for uh, compiling this for WebAssembly will be a different one than the um, configuration steps for running this on the command line. You can see there's output again, so it makes clean the source directory, removes a couple of executables. Um, again, this is truncated. The output is not super important. But um, once you run this, you can then run the next step, which is em configure, and you pass it to dot slash configure file as before. Similar to before, um, this will print a lot of uh, yeah, debug statements here. Not very important. In the end, we have something something that reads config status, so executing libtools commands. Next up is to run em make make. So you can see already why I showed you before how to run this, because now it's essentially just everything the same, but with the par uh, parallel transcription commands before. This will run the make command. You can see this uh, is now pretty different because it now goes into Inscripten. So you can see already references files from um, my local install of Inscripten. Again, very long output, truncated. At the end, it says nothing to be done for all, which means the program is done. Um, where does this leave us? Well, eventually, we have two WebAssembly files, actually three in this case. Um, the important ones are in the source. So there's a source and pivot plasm and source folder as plasm. Um, in this case, we're only interested in um, the uh, mkbitmap program. And if you look closely, there's actually two other files. Um, there's mkbitmap and Fortrace. And um, internally, they're actually JavaScript files. They don't, they just don't have the uh, .js menu. But this is important um, because we will need those files in the future. So what can we do with those? Well, we can actually, as before, run those on the command. And um, if I pass the minus minus version command, this time to um, the JavaScript file and the bitmap, remember it just doesn't have the JavaScript uh, ending, um, and run it with node, you can see that we get the same output as before. So this looks promising already. Um, it seems like our compilation to Plasm has succeeded. <coughs> we have the version number exactly the same and the copyright notice exactly the same as before on the command line, but this time executed in Node. So this is the baseline uh, compilation, but uh, for the thing to actually run in the browser, we will need to um, fine tune this a little bit. So we will pass some additional command lines. So vm configure, configure as before, but this time we uh, specifically tell it that the host is version 32, so we compile it for version 32. And then we pass manually some command line flags. So there's a s file system plus one, which means well, we need the file system because remember um, in the file system uh, or if we run this uh, locally on the command line, we needed to pass commands like uh, input dot pdm or bpm and uh, minus o for the output dot pdm. Um, so you can see already this references files on the file system that we need to emulate in WebAssembly in the future. And um, we need to export some runtime methods fs for the file system methods that we will. Uh, used in the future. And then we also need to manually call the main. So um, we export the call main. So we want to get a, a modern build. So we want to have ES6. And uh, we want to have a modularized build. So we pass S modularized one and S export ES6, which gives us ES6 output. And then um, we want to run this manually. So we don't want the uh, main function to uh, be executed manually, uh, automatically, sorry. We want to um, invoke it manually whenever we want to um, yeah, convert one image to another. So 
we just prevent the automatic run that by default transcripts then would create. So now is the first time that we can run this in the browser. For running it in the browser, well, we need to have an um, HTML page, pretty simple. So this is no uh, secret at all. It's uh, just a super baseline HTML page that <coughs> loads the script.js file that we will continue drafting in the next process. So it's type module that's kind of important because we said we want to have a modern ES6. So let's actually look into our script.js file. And here we load the mkbitmap.js file. Um, I just renamed it. Um, so from mkbitmap to mkbitmap.js so that it's uh, yeah, more uh, practical to uh, work with. Um, and I import the load lesson from the mkbitmap. Next, I have a function that I call run, which is an async function that gives me back the module when I await the loading of the task module. And then I can just lock the module and eventually run the function. How does this look like? Um, nothing to see yet. All we can see is we have a VASM module that gets locked onto the command line here. So that's a, a higher level and scripted module from the WebAssembly module that we can see. And you can see already the first line is the FS for file system that we have exported manually. Um, somewhere in there, there's the call main function. Remember, we exported the call main. And there's a lot of other stuff that we won't be needing right now. Um, actually, most of it is just for the background. Um, if uh, MScript needs to do certain operations, it just calls those functions in All right, so let's improve the function a bit. Um, the next step is we want to run um, the version parameter that we have before. So instead of passing minus minus version, I now just call minus D, which is essentially the same, just shorter. Um, and you can see how I execute the main function. I just have the um, module as before. But this time I have module dot call main and then an array minus D. That's the modification here. And if I run this, you can now see on the command line that I have for the first time in the browser, the same version number than before, plus the copyright notice as we've seen on the command line and as we've seen executed with no. But now finally in the browser. So all this is headed in the right direction. It looks like um, our compilation has worked. So now we need to make it something more useful. Um, so something you might want to do sometimes is you might want to redirect the um, console logs, so the default print statements, to somewhere else. So for example, you could just um, redirect the console output to um, directly the um, body so that it locks into the body. You can see how we do this. Um, we have um, the print function here that our module um, gets. And um, we just pass it the text as a parameter. And then we uh, <coughs> just append it to a variable that we have defined before, which is console output. So you can see I have a prepended console output with powered by space, and then I just take um, whatever I get from um, the console log, and then I print this onto the body. Let's take a look in the browser. So you can see from the console, we have now redirected the output onto the main body. So you can see it's rendered in HTML. So this is just a basic step. Sometimes it's useful to do this, um, but yeah, you can see where this is headed. So now for the first time, we can power HTML based on the output from others. Not quite exciting yet because it's only logging the version number. So how do we get the next step? So the next step is, of course, we somehow need to pass it a file. How do we do this? <clears throat> well, we need to somehow get the file into the WebAssembly file system that um, get create, but, uh, got created by um, MScript. The way this works is, that we need a buffer. A buffer is something that we can get easily from fetch, from the fetch API. So we await a fetch call where we somewhere from the internet, um, where it could be just a local server, fetch, for example, a PMP, so a Windows bitmap file. This gives us um, a response. And from the response, we then get the array buffer. And this array buffer is then something that we can write onto the um, emulated file system. So you can see, module.fs write file, and we give it a file name, example.bmp, and then we uh, just wrap our buffer into a uint8 array buffer. And um, 
if in the next step this has succeeded, we should see if we read the directory of, uh, of the file system um, that the file should be there. So let's take a look what this looks. And um, we can see there's a number of um, default files that are always there. So we have temp, we have home, we have dev, we have proc, um, and we have our actual file, which is example of bitmap. So now we have put a file into the file system of the WebAssembly module. So next step would be how do we pass this file over to the actual um, MK bitmap? Well, it's not uh, a big problem because all we need to do is we need to remember how we call this file on the command line. So we have module or main, and in the simplest possible way, we just pass it example.bmp um, as a command line parameter, and we do exactly the same here. And then if you look what is in the um, Wasm module now, in the file system now, with read here, you will see that now we have for the first time um, an actual output. So example.bmp, and now number seven in the array is example.pdm. So it has worked. We seem to have an output, but it's in the um, file system that is virtual. It's emulated. We need to somehow get this to the user. How do we do this? Well, um, pretty similar than before, but the other way around. So first, um, we need to um, yeah, call the main function as before. And then I start in the middle with the output. We need to, from the file system, read the file example.pdm. Its encoding is binary, so we pass this. And then we get an output. The next, we need to um, get this somehow onto the hard disk. Pretty quick and dirty way is to just um, create a new file with the file constructor, pass it to the output, which is an example of PDM file with the name example of PDM. And it has the MIME type image slash x dash portable bit. So that's the MIME type of the PDM um, file extension x dash portable dash bitmap. And we pass this file, this, this, this file now that we have created to um, a virtual anchor tag. So a tag that we create, document create element a. We pass it the href and give it log URL. So URL dot create object URL based on the file. And we pass it a download attribute, giving it the file name. And then we can programmatically click this uh, anchor link that we have not even appended to the DOM, but we can programmatically click it. So as I said, it's kind of a hack, um, but it's uh, a well-established hack that allows us to um, get a file out of the browser and download it locally to the hard disk. If I look now in my um, downloads, you will see that I have the example.emp input image. And you can see we have the traced black and white example.pdm image that is now a pixel image, but black and white. So, wow, this seems to have worked. We have for the first time give it gone, gone from an input file finally over to an output file. So, the rest is essentially just we need to configure this and make it um, dynamic. So remember before when I showed you the command line flex, so it was mkbitmap minus o output pdm input bfp minus s minus 3 minus f minus blah, whatever. Um, the commands are exactly from the uh, mkbitmap man page, man page. And um, I just pass this exactly like that to the call main function with an array that I've structured here. So you can see everything is a uh, single, single entry. But I've uh, paired the ones that are um, semantically together, like minus O output dot PDM, for example, is one line. And um, you can see minus F four and so on is one line. And um, they're all um, special separate entries. And um, if we run this, well, we get um, the same as on the command line, but in the row. REST is essentially just wrapping this in a JavaScript um, function that we can call from uh, a higher level program like this. You can see here, this is the finished demo and kbitmap.glitch.me. If you want to try this at home, um, you can upload the image to the application. Um, then you can um, pass the different yeah, options to the file and then see in real time how this application changes. Um, you can see it down in the top uh, bottom corner um, what is the actual command line um, command that this uh, emulates, but just in the browser. And you can see real time updated the output of this program.
So this is essentially just JavaScript wrapped around what we've seen before from the um, internal calls that we have built step by step from the previous uh, couple of slides. And um, yeah, we've seen this is the first time a finished WebAssembly file um, running in a browser in an actually useful um, web, web application. So in many cases, how to Wasm will boil down to compiling the Hello World and then figuring out the rest of the compiler parameters. So I'm not sure if you know the uh, how to draw an owl meme, but in many cases, it is like that. So you draw two circles, and then you draw the rest of the owl. In this case, it's exactly the same. So you compile the Hello World, and then you figure out the rest of the compiled parameters that you will need to actually get something useful out of this program. Well, how do you get those uh, compiled parameters? The bad news is with experience. So the good news is also with experience. But um, yeah, you need to just compile a bunch of uh, programs, see where typically things fail. Um, a lot of it is also just um, using a search engine of your choice, looking for the errors, finding if there's someone else who has tried it before, or someone who got a similar um, program compiling error with something else. And then just trying, and um, yeah, at one point it will just magically start. It's a bit of a search, to be honest, but um, I think it's worth it because in the end you end up with a program that you can execute in the browser, you can execute on the server, you can run it in your edge um, function if you want to, or cloud functions, whatever. Um, it's super best. But yeah, it's sometimes a little bit complex to find the compiler parameters, but once you have them you will see it's a lot of fun to work with WebAssembly. So from there on, where do you continue? Um, we at Google have WebAssembly portal. Um, we will make the slides available, so don't worry if you don't see the actual links behind this. Um, the WebAssembly portal has many more links for you to uh, get started. Um, what is WebAssembly and where did it come from is essentially um, part of the first part of this deck, but in more details in a written form, and then also the second or the third link actually is from padding and get that to assembly. That's the second part of this deck, but again in more details. So that you can, um, if this was a little bit too fast or if uh, you didn't like um, that, yeah, you could not see every single step. Um, in this article, you can see every single step. You can see also how I step by step come up with these compiled parameters and how, for me as well, it fails. So actually try to write up step by step how I approached it. And um, you can see from Failure to failure to failure until fix, 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 and fix until eventually, for me, it works in the article. I presented in the stack of course the uh, magically by the end already working version, but in the article, I show you the process of how I got there. The fourth link that I want to give you is WebAssembly performance patterns for web apps. And that's a lot of practitioners' tips. So if you work with WebAssembly in practice, um, you definitely want to check out those performance tips and uh, optimize your WebAssembly code to run with optimal performance. There's also um, things you can do at the uh, compilation level, which is um, compiling already with some optimizations built in. There's a tool called Binarian that allows you to do so. And um, yeah, the core idea of this is compiling Blasm, Blasm modules in a way that they're optimized. And optimized in this case means mostly for size. So not having unnecessary code, using certain patterns that make uh, the code shorter, so essentially just shrinking it so that it gets as small as possible over the wire so that you don't have to download a lot of um, megabytes that are, um, or kilobytes depend on the size of your WebAssembly module that are not being needed because there would be an optimized. Then we have uh, a couple of talks that I want to um, yeah, recommend you watch. Write once, run anywhere, finally, finally realized with WebAssembly. This gives you a lot of um, yeah, just ideas how people use WebAssembly in practice. Um, there's also a small tutorial inside where you show something like um, an image filter that is written in um, C++ converted to um, WebAssembly. So you can see, similar to this example um, with mkbitmap, you can see another example how I'm using bitmap operations and um, run them in WebAssembly. <clears throat> WebAssembly at Google is a, a talk that we gave a couple of uh, weeks ago where um, we look at, well, WebAssembly at Google. So it turns out Google is a very, very, very big uh, consumer of WebAssembly. We use WebAssembly a lot internally for a lot of tools. Um, some of them you may actually be using every single day. 
good example is uh, Google Sheets, um, which is linked in uh, well one um, slide deck further down. So that's how Google Sheets uses Glass and GC. So Google Sheets uses WebAssembly internally. Um, but before that, there's bringing Adobe's creative cloud to the web. It's an example of how Photoshop um, was built with WebAssembly. So you can get an idea how Adobe took um, a decades old code base, um, like Photoshop is many, many years old by now. It has evolved a lot, of course, but how they took this code and compiled it to WebAssembly. And then finally, the final resource that I want to uh, give you is uh, Wasm assembly. So it's kind of a word play, web assembly, Wasm assembly. So Wasm assembly is Wasm and assembly is, yeah, people come together to talk about something. Web assembly um, is, well, Wasm assembly is my podcast where I bring together people from the web assembly community to chat about web assembly on the podcast. And with that, um, yeah, thank you very much. Um, this is, uh, yeah, an introduction to web assembly. I hope you could. Yeah, work with this. I hope you could get started. I hope you um, got intrigued by the opportunities. And with that, I want to hand it back to Damian. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you. That's great, uh, Thomas. I think we are going to be <clears throat> adding all these links to the description of uh, the YouTube video. Some of these talks that you recommended are actually worth watching a lot because they are actual use cases in the real world which is something that you have worked as well and maybe we can even do at some point a follow-up with you talking about experiences where this works where this doesn't but this was amazing and actually it's going to give developers uh the opportunity to start uh working on this which is something that some developers don't necessarily have the chance to work on a daily basis but it's, it, it is there and it's a great tool especially now that the AI uh, technologies are coming, right? So this is going to be a great foundation for that. So thank you very much, Thomas. And yeah, this is, this is pretty much it. Thank you.